given that we are uh, kind of like on the front lines of a war against nature, the things we see are often not pretty. You are listening to Urban Wildlife Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Urban Wildlife Podcast. Tony and I, this is Billy, are sitting in my car. Uh, we're about to talk to um, Michelle and Rick about their wildlife rehab work in Philadelphia. Hi, podcast listeners. We're also going to include an interview with Subaru, who is involved in wild animal rescue in Bangalore, India. You'll remember Yatin Kalki, who's a snake rescue and researcher extraordinaire from our last episode. Subaru's a friend of his uh, and offers a great perspective on wildlife rescue rehab all the way from India. I also want to remind you that we have a Patreon account that you can contribute to at www.patreon.com slash urbanwildlifecast, where we're raising a little bit of money for some better microphones to improve your listening experience. Thank you. So yeah, I hope you like this episode. If you want to get in touch with us, do so at urbanwildlifecast at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter at urbanwildlifecast or find us on Facebook and let us know what you think of the podcast. Oh, you had one correction about a name from previous podcast episode? Yeah. So, I reread a wonderful compliment um, from uh, Nathaniel Sharp, and I mistook it. I didn't look, I didn't stalk this person's Facebook profile and look at the pictures and really catch my mistake. But it's not um, I, the guy from the International Science. It's a different um, Nathaniel Sharp. Um, so I just wanted to apologize for getting it mixed up. But uh, next time, I will do my due diligence and stalk the hell out of everybody's Facebook profile who writes us, so I make sure I don't uh, mix up people with identical names. Easy mistake. Michelle Wellard, um, Assistant Director of Philadelphia Metro Wildlife Center. Okay, cool. And so, Tony and I... Say hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Um, we are... Um, so this is a, a temporary location for them. You guys recently had a, a, a split with your previous organizational mm-hmm. organizational home, and so now you're in a temporary location and looking for a permanent location. And so it's a small building in King of Prussia, which is like a suburban area right outside of Philadelphia. Right. The weirdest named suburban borough you can think of. But named after an old inn. Yeah. Yeah, so it was like, so it was a, if you give a bar a dramatic name and then it turns out it becomes a, a town and then a whole big shopping area, <laughs> that's what you got. <laughs> um, and so we are standing in a room with a whole bunch of large, like, animal crates, a table. Oh, okay, so so right now what we're looking at... Yeah, I can film them. Yeah, take a quick video. What, what we got over Tony's head right now is a, is a cage with a few little kestrels bobbing their heads around and looking at us. Oh, my God. <laughs> they are um, ones that we raised from fallen nestlings okay. that were not able to. We ideally we always want to re-nest them when possible. Much as we love raising birds, we, we want them to go back to their real parents. But when that's not possible, um, they come here. And so kestrels are small falcons that pop up a lot in urban areas. In Europe, there's a lot of fal- also a lot of kestrels. So what else do we have in the room, Michelle? We have uh, three young, we th- a mixed bag of pigeons. Um, one is uh, recovering from head trauma. One, two oh. are, one is recovering from coccidia, but he's just socializing with them now. And one of them is uh, a baby that was, uh, had a soft tissue injury to his leg. Okay. So they're all pretty much ready to go, and we're just socializing the babies right now so that they can all go as a flock. Got it. And then... By Tony's legs, and this is a, really good, a rolling metal like um, shells with, with different critters on it. We got uh, uh, a, couple a mallard, box, a couple box turtles. Yeah, a couple box turtles. Uh, this one was hit by a car. Yeah. No, can you can you draw me up um, CC's I was in mm-hmm. and him in the veins? All right, so we're gonna back up. Rick came in with what looks like an injured heron. He's badly He's in bad a badly shape. injured heron. Oh god. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that hurts my heart. <laughs> okay. So this happens every day. All day long. Okay. No, a lot of times it's so not someone... as bad as that that we have. He's going getting euthanized right now. Yeah. He's, so that was like very badly mangled great blue heron, which is depressing. Yeah. Um, um, but we save a lot of them too. Oh yeah, yeah. This is such a great need because if we weren't here, there's nobody 
it would take him a few days to die in absolute agony. Yeah. It's so glad. So that's, we're on the front line. Of of mercy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did he get hit by a car? I don't know what happened. Um, the woman called and said he was at a pond and he kept falling over. Yeah. And so she couldn't see what was wrong with the leg until she was uh, close up to him. Okay. So how, long, how did you get into this? Business. I started as a volunteer. This is totally second career for me. My first, my master's degree is in social policy. It has nothing to do with this. I started as okay. a volunteer. Always loved birds. Always loved birds and started volunteering. And, you know, I've always had this existential thing about not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. And as yeah. soon as I started doing this, it was like, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Taking care of birds. And soon after, Rick was looking for a new assistant, and I kind of just pushed my way through. <laughs> And so, what else do we have in the room? Let's just little poke our heads around. Uh, we have uh, Mallard, who was hit by a car. Okay. Um, and she's recovering from a broken wing. This pigeon is also recovering from a broken wing. We don't know how that happened. Um, we have three more kestrels. More kestrels? More kestrels. I don't see kestrels. this many kestrels, Tony. I mean, like, I guess they're all over the place. And I'm keeping yeah, they, the they all come here, like, from yeah. all over. Mm -hmm. And then in here is uh, Mama Opossum. I don't know if you can see her. I can her see the babies, babies poking their heads she out. She was also hit by a car, and her yeah. babies were much smaller when she first came in. And um, she's finished. They, they're starting to come out of her uh, pouch now. Yeah. And she is almost ready to go. We just want the babies to get a little bit bigger and be a little bit more independent before she goes. Okay. She's kind of weaning them now. She's leading them to the food dish, which is interesting. All right. We have a snapping turtle who's recovering from a cracked shell which we don't know, but we can assume it's a car. Because, I would assume that too, yeah. Uh, it was breeding season for snapping turtles. They're all crossing roads and yeah. lay their eggs. And then what is under that? This is also a box turtle. Wow, all right. And I can't remember what his issue was. Okay. <laughs> would you say cars are the primary reason? Cars and domestic cats are the big thing. Okay. Um, but a lot of other human caused things like accidental lawn mowering over um, oh, nest of baby rabbits, things yeah. like that. And then you've got the small, the cruelty or um, yeah. kidnapping fledglings accidentally and feeding them for two weeks, and then. <laughs> so what is so that's an interesting point. What do you mean by kidnapping fledglings accidentally? So baby birds, as you know, jump out of the nest a few a few days before they can fly and spend a few days hopping around on the ground, yep. uh, finishing up learning to fly. They learn to fly from the ground up, not from the nest down, pretty much. And people will say, "Oh my God, a tiny baby bird! It needs help!" And they will take it, and its parents are looking after it. Right. And then they'll start feeding it. And after a week or so, when it starts to go downhill, they'll call us and say, oh, we need help with this baby bird. But normally, most people call us first. And they'll say, we found this bird on the ground, and then I'm able to either send, email me a quick picture. That's a fledgling, leave it alone, and I'll explain what's going on. Yeah. And that's an important point, because like 50% of our work is done on the phone. Telling people, actually, that's not a problem, or you'll never see the bunny's mother. She yeah. only spends 10 minutes a day with them, or the baby fawn uh, okay. is always left on its own. So yeah. being a place that people can call and go, oh, I don't have to worry? Okay, good. That's great. Well, that yeah. was interesting to learn. So working at environmental education center, uh, we intercept a, a fair amount of those calls. <laughs> <laughs> call, I'm like, fledging, leave it. Yeah, you know? yeah. So you get the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, as no one is like the bird guy in, around town, people are just every May and June. People are flooding me with pictures of fledglings. I'm like, just leave them. Yeah. Come back. Yeah. Leave them. And I think, with, and I, I had this experience once with nestlings, where we had some nestling. It was, I lived in, I grew up in Central Ohio, but at our house, I think some uh, nestling sparrows had fallen out, and I had, um, I think my dad accidentally destroyed the nest or something. I don't know. Um, but long story short, is I took what was left in the nest, put it in a box, sort of taped it to my windowsill. And the parents came and took it over from there. That's exactly, we, I've had three occasions this summer where somebody, and a robin's nest fell, and we yeah. told people to use a wicker basket with a handle. Yep. And they sent me pictures, oh my God, it worked, the parents are still <laughs> feeding. So that's the way we can help just on the phone, like, you know, yeah. reunite a robin family. Yeah. So. And in Philadelphia and its environs, the need is so great. I mean, you're seeing a little bit with the phone calls you get. It's just absolutely overwhelming need for wildlife care, and there's nobody else doing it, and there's no... Um, you know, government support for it. There's no people think you know the, the government is taking care of this, and it's just little nonprofits just doing yeah. it as best they can. So well, what, when I worked at Heinz um, as an intern for you know, it's part of the Fish and Wildlife Service. So people assumed the service part like we come out and you know, and again I'm like no. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I have a groundhog in my heart. I'm like yeah, 
<laughs> I was like, that's awesome. Um, did we show you the rest? Yes. Oh, there's someone clocking up with a cage right there. Oh, someone's walking. Okay. All right. We have another intake. Yeah, Hi. Hello. Hello. So this is a group of volunteers in our main working room. We call this room like the nursery. Okay. Because we've got a lot of baby animals in this room. Right now, it's a lot of birds. So they start off with these incubators, and then they move to little soft cages here. Like this guy is taking his first bath over there. Okay. So they're cleaning out their cages. Hey, podcast listeners. For the next minute and 40 seconds or so, we'll be talking over the sound of a bunch of fledgling chimney swifts. They make a very intense noise that might not please everyone's ears. So if it's too much for you, go ahead and skip about another minute and 40 seconds, and then you'll be past the chimney swifts. Thanks. So now we're opening up an incubator. Oh, man. Whoa. You hear that, right? So these are chimney swifts. True to their, true to what they do, they're hanging on the sides of the box because they can't really sit well on the bottom. So Michelle is using a little forest app and feeding them for those dead they were, worms. They were alive and they didn't gather just need water. Yeah. Why do you think people are in home renovations or something like that? Not many, but they're, they're known to be a difficult species to raise, so we take a lot of pride in doing uh, well. And what is hard about chimney swifts? Uh, the nutrition makes them so big and strong. Okay. Um, they're very resilient. They're not fed on time, not overfed, not underfed, keeping them scrupulously clean, not getting food on them. Get them from the other side of the wedding site. So guys, for the people who are listening to this, um, when you see those birds that look like flying boomerangs, like, over your city, um, that's what they look like, it's the pictures we're going to post. <laughs> here we got some baby robins. Okay. You guys, birders, you can identify Tony, what's that? All right. <laughs> look, at that, look at that, look at that beak. Oh, this is a, a house fish. No. Not a house What is it? Bigger. Look at that Icterid beak. Oh, <laughs> oh. Icterid beak. It's a coward. Ah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. Is that the one you couldn't name at first? The no, coward. there's another guy in there. We don't know what he is. So this guy's a coward, and obviously we don't, people sometimes say, oh, you rehabilitate cowbirds? But <laughs> we don't place human morals on them. They are nest parasites, but that's what yeah. they can call so to do. So cowbirds, for, for quick background, are, um, are birds that evolved following, uh, basically following herds of bison and stuff. I think that's, I have mixed, we'll talk about that. I have mixed feelings on whether that's The story is that they evolved following. There's bison. lots of new world, there's lots of the cowbirds that, in, in the tropics that don't follow bison. No, 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 but the ones that are met are. That and they're brood them. parasites. Oh, they are? Yeah. Okay, well then we'll skip that part of the, the myth. <laughs> yeah, but they're brood parasites, they lay eggs in other birds' nests. The other birds then sort of feed the cowbird, and the nestling cowbird then pushes the other birds out of the nest. Um, I've seen so, a mother house sparrow feeding a giant cowbird baby. Right, and like funny. little warblers, like well, that are like smaller than house sparrows, will be feeding these giant cowbird babies. Yeah. And so now we've got some mystery nestlings. Well, this one is a house sparrow. This one is a house finch. Okay. And this is the mystery bird. Usually, we're really good at IDing nestlings, but we don't know what he is. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Hopefully we'll get you don't even. Can find out. <laughs> but he's a passerine baby. His, his parents are going to be feeding insects, so that's what we're. You doing. know what it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. And so we have his diet, no matter what he feathers into. 
And so even though they're, you know, we try to put them on cost specifics whenever we can, because it's good for the growth of their own kind. Yeah. Absolutely that, just other baby birds. Mm -hmm. And then once them. they're big enough to, to be flying, you pull, where do you tend to release them? So uh, them go, babies can be released in just a good habitat somewhere, okay. you know, where there's others of their kind. Yeah. Um, adults, we would try to take back within a mile of where they came from. Okay. If it's a territorial, like a red tailed hawk who has an established territory, we would try to take them back where it came from. Okay. Um, and then we have, so it's bird season, so it's really heavy on baby birds right now. So after they come out of these incubators, they go to little soft cages So here. like a little soft, like mesh-sided cages? They're uh, butterfly, uh, butterfly enclosures, that's what they're made for. Some and, fledgling robins. and there's a there's a mockingbird oh, in there, too, a, a little mocker too. in there. He kind of fits the, the profile. Oh, he's the one. He's the middle guy. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the white on the... Tail. I see him pop, popping his tail up too. Yeah, he's got his it's little hard tail. Like, he's well, barely got a tail, well, the, but he's still in, flicking it up. In like field guys, they don't even illustrate birds at this age. Like, the, 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 it's like the hardest time because there's, there's like they only look like that for two weeks, right. and they don't even bother illustrating. Adult, not yeah. 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 Robins, two morning doves. One was a nestling that we raised, and one was a cat, cat attack victim okay. who had his week of antibiotics and getting his wounds treated. So just to reduce their stress at being in captivity, we put them together. So they, they calm down in the presence of another species, that really, of another of their same species, it really helps them. And if you listen to the podcast, you know this already, but we'll say it again, keep your cats inside. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if a genie came down and gave me three wishes, that would be my number one before a million dollars. <laughs> Do something about the outdoor cats, yes. yeah. Um, yes, so we did a lot of birds. This is really common. This is a box of opossums. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> so it's very common for mother opossums to get hit by cars and then have a pouch full of babies. Oh. So a lot of times people, so these will, guys people will bring the whole carcass or they'll pull the babies out themselves if they're not yeah. squeamish. So these are five baby opossums each size of like a chipmunk. Mm -hmm. um. And they're about seven weeks old already. Oh, that's cute. They're born like, you know, the size is top to be your thumb. What do these guys eat? Right now, they're on a special possum formula. Of course, and then, a possum um, formula. Yep, right. there's, we have formulas for every species that you get from a, a vet supply. Okay. And then, in about a week or two, we'll start introducing them to some solid food, some pieces of chopped rat or cockerel meat. Okay. And start to wean them. And then when they're about Wait, nine inches what from... What was the other meat besides rat? Cockerel, day old chick. Okay. Thanks. Um, when they're about nine inches from nose to butt, um, they'll be old enough to, not including tail, they'll be old enough to be released. Okay. Wow. They didn't pass as cute as they They really are. There's Do you a, get raccoons much? We are not taking baby raccoons at this location because we don't have, the babies get, you know, they're they get this big. The know. raccoons are a little bit more of a handful than possible. They are. They're also a rabies vector species, so only, yeah. only volunteers who've had their prophylactic rabies shots can handle them. In our old location, we raise many baby raccoons. So baby then does that hold for skunks and foxes skunks, also? Skunks, foxes, bats, coyotes. What else? Raccoons. I think I got them all. Yeah. <laughs> and cats and dogs, but yeah, yes. it's different. that's a different business. I saw... Um, was it last year or this year? As other to the rabies report, it, there was one cow. A cattle had babies. Wow. Oh, I have heard of this. I wonder if you yeah. got bit by a bat or a bat or something. I don't know. So, no, there's not really what's like a bats around here, but problem, I guess, you know, a dog or a cat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we see other possums and carriers. So these are uh, possums who were uh, injured as juveniles. This one was, I think, uh, he has an unknown reason for his injury to his snout. He's got a wound on his snout oh. and an injured eye. Okay. Uh, but he is probably going to be okay. And this guy, I can't remember. I'd have to look at his paperwork. Oh, uh, what's that little baby? Red eared slider. Oh, Someone brought that's tricky. Yep. <laughs> I know, same thing. Uh, well, we're not going to release him. That's the thing, because it's yeah. illegal to release them, actually. Right. Um, yeah. So we will find a home for him. Good luck. Yes. All right. We get maybe 15 calls a month about, we want to donate some red-eared sliders to you, <laughs> because we're bored of them now. <laughs> and they're the size of dinner plates. Yeah. I was about, yeah. To, say, 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 about to say the same thing. I, I had two sliders at our center that, the, you know, our center was a nonprofit in the city building, but the city decided to take it over. Um, so I inherited from the old organization two sliders. 
and people are always wanting to give me more sliders. And I'm like, no. Nope. So red eared sliders are commonly, illegally, but still commonly sold as itty bitty hatchlings that are adorable, and then they get bigger. Um, real fast. Real fast. And they're not native to here, they're native to the border, middle part of the United States, um, but they still get dumped in waterways a lot. Most of those probably die, but enough have survived. They've set up breeding populations that people are concerned they compete with um, red belly cooters, which are native threatened species in PA and lots of other stuff. Um, so message there, never buy a baby turtle. And, and never release domestic animals never, into the wild. Never oh, release uh, pets. So the mockingbird already knows it's, 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 it's doing its chip milk. <laughs> uh, what's, the, what's in the one mouse every day? He is a uh, uh, California king snake. He's an education animal. Ah, okay. So we have education animals, but they're being held at other centers because we don't have outside cages for them. Okay. Uh, we have, you know, some birds. Um, he's not able to be released because he's a California king snake, but he goes out to school yeah. just to teach children about snakes. Rick, can I ask you a couple of questions? Absolutely. So, how'd you get into this? How'd they get into wildlife rehabilitation? Yeah. Uh, I walked into the ARC Wildlife Center in um, April of 1998 and never stopped. What's ARC Wildlife Center? ARC Wildlife Center is a, is a really cool, wonderful wildlife rehabilitation center in Bucks County. Okay. Back then it was in Newtown, uh, near Bucks County Community College. It's where most people get their start. So they're like the genesis of Ever the Wildlife Center and Ever the Wildlife Rehabilitator. The Mothership. Rehabilitator. <laughs> the Mothership, yes. It was founded by Mary Jane Stretch, who's been doing wildlife rehabilitation since 1965. And she's still, she's still there and still the, the founder and, and director. Um, and I just absolutely fell in love with it and said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life on day one. I walked in on day one and said, bam, that's what I'm doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty similar. Like, I was like, oh my yeah. God, I finally found it. I found, I found it. I found yeah. it. Yes, yeah. this is what I want to do. Right. So where does both, uh, I mean, you mentioned it's a small nonprofit organization. Where does your funding come from? Our funding comes from individual contributions, grants, and um, foundation support. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. One thing, you know, it's like, um, like, what's your rate of what you intake to what you release? Good That's question. Uh, so... To preface that, I should say every animal should get and deserves by our code of ethics prompt, humane, appropriate care for that animal. So an animal comes in and is mangled by a cat and its intestines are out, that animal has the right to euthanasia, as we say. Um, so our goal as success is not necessarily getting the animal released. The success is treating that animal for what it needs. For example, that great blue heron you saw just came in, yeah. had a cut That's off. That's not a failure. It's not a failure. Like, mm -hmm. it's, right. That animal was suffering greatly. It had its leg cut off, and its leg was hanging by a piece of skin with the bone sticking out. It had maggots all throughout its body. That animal had the right to, to have humane care, which is what we gave it. In this case, was we gave it a pain sedative immediately, intravenously, and then euthanasia. Um, that being said, I'm not trying to evade the question, the release rate is about 60%. Given that we are uh, kind of like on the front lines of a war against nature, the things we see are often not pretty. We get things that are mauled by cats, mauled by cars, crashing into buildings, uh, shot, poisoned, caught in um, netting and things like that. So it's often, there's not a pretty side of all the rehabilitation. So even given that, our, our release rate is about 60%. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was on a, a different perception. I, 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 th I didn't realize it was so high. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also because the reason it's so high is because some things come in, they're only uh, legitimately orphaned. We very take, take a lot of care to make sure things are not kidnapped, uh, like bunnies in the yard or fledgling birds and things like that. The things that are legitimately orphaned, like a tree is cut down in a nest of robins, they can't be returned to a tree that's cut down. Um, if they come in here reasonably healthy like that, they're, they're uh, you know, with our experience and knowledge, we can pretty co consistently raise things like that. Yeah. That's why the success rate is about, or not the success rate, but the, the, uh, the release rate is about 60%. I don't. I don't want to like get sound like get like too emotional, but like <laughs> I I came in here kind of like I always respect what, what wildlife rehabbers do, um, but was always kind of like curious about like the numbers game because also you're feeding animals other animals and but like I tell you what, and I was planning like they ask like kind of like uh, the kestrel sort of broke your heart. No, <laughs> the heron. I was all, I almost lost I almost lost my shit seeing that heron. It's like one of my favorite things to see in the world. Come in. 
in this horrible shit. I mean, well, like, but you're. I mean, I, I've never been there before. I mean, I've been. To, I got to where tri state, but it was like, kind of like maybe like more like sanitized. Like yeah. And like so, I never like I uh, almost always I, I I'm I'm a middle of the bird guy. People bring me stuff, and then you know I've come <clears throat> I've dropped stuff off before, and it's all it's almost always a one way trip, you know. Um, and um, but um, someone kind of like get, you know after how many times you call and you're like how that you know surf scooter do down, down the shore or how that you know wait through it and you know it's like oh you know Paris you're like and then like but once I saw it inside I'm like yeah. I get it. like <clears throat> like I guess I'm like a natural skeptic and then like just kind of how I roll and then I, I come in here I'm like I get it I like I just I like I totally get it now. Well, like, nothing, you know, I don't mean to say like I didn't get it before, but I mean like all the those questions of like the validity of what you do that I was gonna like want answered. Like I think I answered by seeing by it. just being I'm like oh well, I get. But it. I still wanna I'll still ask a couple questions that are in that vein, but yeah. like which is I think it's even if we're sort of feeling one over, I think it's it's something that it's I think interesting to talk about, and it's a similar question I asked um, to the other people we interviewed for this episode. Um, which is, you know, what are our obligations to, to let's call them non-domestic animals that live around us and with us. And so, like, if I saw, if, you know, we're out hiking deep in the Poconos or something and we see, um, <coughs> I don't know, a, uh, some orphaned animal or some um, injured animal, you know, let's just say injured, um, and it's, you know, you sort of say, okay, it's the wild, this is what happens, you know, it'll probably get picked off after dark by a, by some predator or something like that, and that's just how, you know, wild ain't pretty. Um, but what is what is different about that when you're... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure you get to ask this question all the time. Um, it's something, obviously, you've done it for enough years, you've thought about it a lot. Like, how are obligations different when it's, in, when it's a possum that... Is like many generations living in the city, you know, or um, raccoons in the suburbs, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's what human beings do to wildlife is that what is what we fix. Yeah. So a possum being swooped down on by a great horned owl and the owl grabbing it, sure. that's that's nature. Yeah. A possum being hit by a car or poison or something like that is a different story. That's what we that's what we're here to fix. And it's really a sacred obligation that we have to these animals to to uh, to right what's been done wrong to them. One of the things Rick told me in the very beginning was we are not interfering, we are uninterfering. Uninterfer we're okay. putting these animals back to the state they were before human beings did their damage to them. So before they hit yeah. them with the car, hit them with a the lawnmower, let their cat get them or whatever. So an awkward yeah. conversation we have is sometimes people try to bring us an animal and they say, there was this bunny in my yard and a hawk came down and grabbed it and I threw a bottle at it and yelled at the hawk and chased it away and now bringing this bunny. And it's this awkward conversation where I'm like, oh, no. No, now you've got a so hungry hawk. You say, you've got a hungry hawk, and yeah. you've got a suffering bunny. Whereas if you what left it alone, <laughs> the the hawk would have finished the bunny quickly, and that's nature, and would have eaten it. People yeah. don't always want to hear that. Okay. The real reason I do this. Did you ever read the Lord of the Rings? Gandalf. A few dozen times. A few yeah. dozen times <laughs> as well. You know the backstory. Gandalf um, is rescued and he gets his bacon saved several times by Gwahir the eagle. The backstory yeah. on that. <laughs> Why, is, why are they friends? Because Gandalf found that eagle when he was shot by a human arrow. Yeah. And he healed that eagle, and that eagle, they were forever lifelong friends. But that really stuck with me as a child. I was eight years old when I read The Hobbit. Yeah. And I was like, wow, Gandalf found an eagle that was shot with an arrow. And he said to that eagle, like, you matter, your life matters. And that's what I say to every animal I treat that goes through my hands. I say, you, you matter, your life matters. Even if I'm putting you down and easing your suffering, like, your life matters. Yeah. Right. I've been haunted by this goldfinch that I, I, I encountered in a field with a broken wing. And I left it there. And in my mind, I was like, well, Cooper Salt got to eat, you know? Yeah. Sure. But, like, I don't know. I don't, I still, I, well, where was the field? What was the surface? It was in, it was in Pennyback Park. And, um, I assume if a goldfinch got hit by a car, it would be done. So I, yeah. you know, I assume it was a, a non, you know. And it wouldn't have made it into the field. Yeah. I, yeah. And, so, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. What do you think I should have done? <laughs> like every other animal I've encountered in a field, I've br I've brought like you know like it, um, and there's been many. And also, I'm also the one people bring stuff to me, and I and I either bring it up myself or I, or I tell them who to take it to. But in the cases, what do you think? If you see a goldfinch with a broken wing, you probably you all would definitely take it in probably, right? 
I'm sorry. If you saw a bird, if yeah. you're in the wild and you see a bird yeah. in the bird, if I saw course. a cooper's hawk eating because, it, I would leave alone. Right. But if I saw it sitting there by itself, right. I don't know what hurt it, so I'm yeah. gonna help it. No, you, 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 you def your default is humane care. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's interesting. Is in that same field? Another time, I saw an American pipit fly, like flapping around. And what's a pipit? Uh, it's a it's a long legged um, song songbird that like like likes to walk around in open areas okay. so and we have one species here American Pippet and um, and I saw it flapping around and I was like oh it's injured and then it, it caught it it flew a little bit and a sharp and hawk whacked it right there and what it I think what happened was that bird the hawk already had it we walked up didn't see it the hawk flushed off of it and then we uh, was we're waiting there it uh and you walked away a little bit in the hawk. And back, yeah, yeah, and it, but if I would have, you know, we, if I didn't, if that hawk hadn't come back and got it, I would have probably taken that to a rehab center, not knowing, it, you know. But I hope that's what happened with the goldfinch that uh, that Somebody a cougar's hawk it, whacked yeah. it and it came back for it. But I, I'm haunted to this day. There's a lot of contradictions in wildlife rehab. Like we will, you know, we order mice by the hundreds and hundreds. But if someone brings us an injured mouse, we're gonna take care of it like anything else. Yeah. <laughs> so. Then, okay. So that, that's that's kind of. One of the questions I have is like, how do you make that call? Because you're feeding, you're, you know, this is one of the arguments I had with cat folks is they, they say, well, it's, you can't kill cats, you know, you can't euthanize them, it's inhumane. I'm like, but you're not only are you letting them kill wild animals, you're feeding them domestic animals and fish. Like, how's that? Like, but in the case of wildlife rehab, there you are feeding predators um, other animals. No, it's hard. It's, you know? it's, it's, so how, how do you... We don't discriminate because, as you see, we have a lot of house sparrows yeah. and starlings. And one of the reasons is a person brings us an injured bird. People, average person doesn't know native, not native. We don't want to tell people, um, your bird is a bad bird. Therefore, your instinct to care is a bad instinct. Yeah. Also, this house sparrow did not ask to be born a house sparrow, so we're going to take also, care of it. Also, and this is an important point, and it's hard for many people to accept, wildlife rehabilitators do not make a difference in populations. We don't. Maybe once rarely if it's an endangered species, but us I'd say rehabbing. Box turtles might be meaningful. It yeah. might be meaningful, but yeah. if we if we rehabilitate a couple yeah. hundred house sparrows a year, it does not affect the population of house sparrows. It affects that individual animal. Similarly, there's seven billion people on, on planet Earth. If you come across the scene of a car accident and you help a person out of a car accident and uh, give them first aid, you're like, well, how are you influencing Sorry. the population of human beings? You're not. You're helping that person needs help. You don't really care about the population of human beings on planet Earth. You're just helping that person that needs help. It's just a humane, common sense thing. Similarly, we help that house sparrow that needs help. We don't change the population of house sparrows in Philadelphia. Yeah. Nor do we also release them. I mean, we do release house sparrows. We don't release them where there are, uh, uh, you know, bluebird boxes. So we're releasing them deep in the city <laughs> where they're not going to do any harm. Yeah. yeah. So um, we are we are con we are conscious of, of ecology. But uh, yeah, it's well. With that said, though, like I'm not no, no exaggeration. I was uh, um, my friend posted about seeing 27 kestrels in one field in California, and I wrote, I was like, wow. I was like, you can have a you can spend the you know birding we do like these big days to try to see how many things we can see in a day, and I'm like in in our area we might not even get a kestrel in a in a, in a day, you know. And here I am, and you have what, six six, so. Maybe I maybe you do have a lot of of kestrels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, well, because there's, we're the only place for four counties, so the kestrels might be miles and miles away. Yeah, but, but you're not here. I guess, but you don't. I don't see a bunch of red tails or. We've had. We've had is the three, timing of it is. Yeah, it's okay. timing. We had yeah. like what three red tails in the last two weeks. Yeah. Okay, taking in. So Not a lot of red-tailed nestlings this year, though. But we we really we had in our old place we had a, a, a surrogate great horned owl um, who raised baby great horns for us. So that's a question. You just so to jump off that. And one year he had five babies. So why why did that surrogate owl end up staying with you longer? Okay, he had a uh, partially amputated wing. I got him yeah. from a, a nature center in South Carolina while I was down there for a conference. They they couldn't keep him. Okay. Um. So I, you know, talked to them and we. Traded license information, and I, I wound up transferring him up to us in Philadelphia. He's been with us for 12 years now, and uh, he's a non-releasable great horned owl. And we're not in the in the in the habit 
we're in the business of accumulating a lot of animals. That's, that's what that's, I was wondering about. Yeah. That's, we, we don't do that. Because some um, of these, I imagine some just can't be released, but they're right. alive, you know. Right. And out of the many thousands of animals we do every year, when I say that they are the exception, they are the extreme exception. Many thousands of animals every, every year, we, we have like less than half a dozen non-releasables. So um, the fact that an animal cannot survive in the wild and should be euthanized, we don't use that as an excuse to make them a non-releasable non education animal. That's never an excuse. It has to be an appropriate fit. Jackson, our great horned owl, that is non-releasable, happen to be an appropriate fit. But the vast majority of ones that can't be released in the wild, they're not appropriate and it would be cruel to keep them in captivity, so they are humanely put down. And people come to us all the time and they okay. well, if you can't save it, can't you just keep it? Like that, would, that would, you know, with 3,000 animals a year, that would cause hoarding, right. and that could yeah. be a real problem. And also, it's not, well, we're going to keep a squirrel in a cage the rest of its life, that's torture. Right, it's, yeah. it's ethically not the right thing to do, they deserve to be free. Okay. Jackson's an exception. All right. So, we've taken up about an hour of your time, and so I think it's pretty much I've covered yeah. what I wanted to ask. Anything you want to ask? Or? Okay. No. Uh, I think the big question is, how can people support you? So if we can get that information out there um, to our listeners. Well, we're looking for a permanent place. And it's very hard because it has to be a, the appropriate place, it has to have the right zoning, it has to have the amount of like, you know, the, the number of acres. So we're really looking for tips. You know, okay. Because I think this is good. You know, we have a realtor that's working for us and we have all these resources, but I, I think the perfect place is going to come from a personal tip. Like, I know the perfect place that either is for sale or that somebody's donating, <laughs> or that someone can lease it at really yeah. terms or something like that. So we, we're looking for like a nature center kind of something that we can develop into a setting like that. So, and, and then also people who like to donate, I mean, I'm guessing money is always welcome? Oh yes. yeah. Okay. And then do you, uh, I imagine people also like to donate stuff that they've got accumulating and maybe it's welcome, maybe it isn't. What kind of stuff do you actually need if people are... Okay, you stuff. can't go wrong with paper towels. If I got nothing but paper towels from now to the end of the time, I'd be happy. Okay. Because we're cleaning these animals four or five, six times a day, and paper yeah. towels are constantly in use. So paper towels are the number one need for in-kind donation supplies. Okay. And, and we'll, you know, linens and things too, but call us first and we'll let you know what we need. Okay. We'll, we'll put links on, on it, but just say your, um, your website or whatever. phillywildlife.org. Okay, phillywildlife.org. And Pretty follow simple. us on Facebook. You know, we post stories almost every day. Awesome. All right. Well, Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that was interesting. Hi, podcast listeners. In editing this episode, I decided to split it into two parts. This winds up the first part with Michelle and Rick. Um, please check out part two for our chat with Subaru.